Welcome back. Ich hoffe, Sie konnten sich gütlich tun am äh, Lunch, der auch von der Balwars Group äh, gesponsert wurden, wurde. Ähm, und äh, genau, wir hatten einen anregenden Morgen und ich hoffe, es geht auch gleich so weiter. Wir steigen nämlich auch gleich wieder ein äh, mit einer ähm, Keynote äh, von Paul-Olivier Dehay. Er ist Gründer der Hestia Labs und äh, Personal Data IO. Danach folgen wieder Sessions, dann noch eine kleine Kaffeepause und zum Schluss noch die DINACON Awards. Und wer ganz zum Schluss heute Abend noch selber in die Tasten hauen möchte, hier äh, auch im selben Gebäude, findet noch die Hack Night statt ab 19 Uhr. Ähm, gut, äh, auch nochmal der technische Hinweis äh, zu den Fragen. Also auch hier wieder ist unser Slido-Fragenkanal offen. Bitte schnappen Sie sich Ihr iPhone und geben Sie den Code ein oder nehmen Sie diesen QR-Code und stellen da während der Keynote-Fragen an Paul Olivier Dehai. Ich werde Sie dann am Schluss, die, die am meisten Upvotes bekommen haben, werde ich Sie an Paul richten. Genau, cool. Also, dann geht es jetzt mal gleich weiter mit Paul Olivier Dehai. Er ist Gründer, wie gesagt, von Personal Data IO und Hestia Labs. Beide Organisationen sind darauf fokussiert, Datenschutzrechte durchzusetzen und Daten im Kollektiv nutzbar zu machen. Der belgische Mathematiker war Assistenzprofessor für Mathematik an der Uni Zürich und er half mit, den Datenmissbrauchsskandal um Cambridge Analytica ans Licht zu bringen. Ähm, der Vortrag wird auf Englisch sein. Wir haben im Vorfeld mit Paul ein Interview, ein schriftliches Interview gemacht. Die Übersetzung davon finden Sie auch auf unserer Webseite. Um, da finden Sie die meisten Inhalte auch wieder. Well, okay, this is my time to welcome uh, Paul Olivier Dehai to the stage. Thank you. And I will switch the presentation quickly. So hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. I've heard of Dinacon for a little while. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, but watched from afar uh, because I live in Geneva, actually. So today I'll talk to you about my personal journey uh, going from Cambridge Analytica, although of course I was also interested in those topics before, all the way to data collectives. And I'm not doing this to brag, to talk about my personal journey, but more because I've learned a lot of things along the way. And I think it's those are valuable learnings uh, and they are easier to explain when anchored into an individual's own experience and story. So first of all, to talk about my affiliations. Well, I have the bad tendency of creating new organizations, too many. Um, but I think this is actually needed for this problem, the problem I'm trying to address, because we're missing, we're missing new structures to address this problem. It's a bit like uh, trying to be a banker of the 21st century, but stuck in the 14th century when you can only write on paper what, what could be, what, how to have depth to each other and how to transact with money. Um, we need new organizations, we need new ways to think, to think about those problems around personal data. So here are a few. Uh, personal Data IO is a small uh, nonprofit that I founded out of Geneva. I'm no longer a director, I just stepped down to avoid uh, any kind of conflicts. My data is a much larger organization that has around, around 100 members, uh, 100 organizational members, 300 um, individual members, and I sit on that board. And then Estia AI is my private company and I'm working on a project called Estia Labs, and I'll mostly talk about that one. Now, for those of you who don't know, I'll very briefly go over the Cambridge Analytica scandal. So in 2012, reading uh, papers, I learned, like a few other scientists, that um, you could predict personality traits from Facebook likes. So this is a scientifically validated study, peer-reviewed, two of them actually, that show essentially that if you know enough likes, and let me pick an example, close to, uh, close to uh, 120 likes, Facebook likes of someone, then you are as good at predicting uh, personality traits as family members. And so the idea is that you can get into someone's psychology by looking at their Facebook likes. This was in 2012. Oops. Um, now... A lot of people, well, a few people actually looked at this. 
Um, Facebook, first of all, and Facebook introduces, introduced restrictions on access to likes as a consequence because of the privacy implications, but also Steve Bannon and Robert Mercer, who is a big uh, financial, um, a financial guy, someone who has a hedge fund and invests massively into uh, data operations. And what they started doing is supporting um, a company that then worked with Ted Cruz. So in 2015, end of 2015, I read this, paper, this article in The Guardian, and I'm thinking, okay, this is a really important story, and this is a potential for explaining quite a bit of things around how personal data could be used and is used. Obviously, to help me there, I had the fact that I had read this scientific paper before, but also other kinds of experiences around personal data and legal aspects. What was original there was that there was an, an English company, a UK-based company, that was processing data about Americans to try to target messages in the campaign. But also, once you start digging a little bit, you see that they've worked over time with militaries all over the world. So, for instance, in Libya, they are selling, or some subsidiary or partner, selling the capacity of profiling entire populations or subpopulations and affecting their emotions with respect for instance, to the prime minister. You see on the right, the third one, anger towards the prime minister from young and married males. So they have dashboards like this where they try to shift opinion of people and they have marines and anthropologists go on the field and ask questions, you know, who do you look up to? What do you think about this and that? This type of questions to sort of map out populations. Of course, it's very slow, but it's definitely something that the US Army, the British Army is investing a large amount of money into. And this was Cambridge Analytica, and then suddenly, or uh, uh, some close associated company, and then suddenly they start doing this in the digital realm. So instead of having an army that's like dropping flyers and trying to influence people and measuring the impact six months later, the mental picture is something like they're dropping Kindles, and the Kindles are looking at what people are reading and highlighting and sharing, and all of that goes back to headquarters to be analyzed in real time. Right? That was my mental picture. So I started obsessively looking at this for a year and trying to figure out what exactly they were doing. So this was in 2016 in parallel to Brexit and uh, the Trump election. And so what, what they're doing is essentially collecting a bunch of data from different providers, so data brokers, but also uh, what people read, Facebook, uh, the, the commercial Safeway is a supermarket, collecting data from all of those companies to try to predict all kind of different parameters, psychological parameters of people. For instance, one that's very interesting is the need for cognition, something like the sixth one in the list. So how much do you need to think before you make a decision? Right? But then comes the, the, what is the decision that they are trying to nudge you into? Well, lots of people interpreted the Cambridge Analytica scandal as trying to make you vote for a candidate you don't like or you didn't like. You, know, you were voting for Hillary and suddenly you're going to vote for Trump. I think, and from evidence, this is not what they were actually trying to do. What they were trying to do is encourage people to react with reactions, Facebook reactions, to meet in real life, to retweet, to reshare content, um, and, and generally to interact with the campaign, with maybe the most like obsessively, sorry, my, I translated my slides from French, most obsessively measured metric probably being the red hats that they were managing to sell. So it's a regular marketing operation in a sense. They were making money of selling those hats. And they could optimize this as a proxy for later support, of course. So if you remember um, this, these dashboards trying to measure anger from su certain subpopulations, and that's exactly what I could see they were trying to do. They were trying to, engage, to create emotions that would encourage people to react and to repost, to reshare. Now, up until a few weeks ago, that would have seemed still like very implausible, but it's becoming more and more plausible. I don't need to tell you about the new recent uh, Facebook leaks, but it turns out that Facebook is rewarding content with viral spread, is, is amplifying content that has anger reactions on it. And if you look at the timing, these reactions were introduced in February 2016, you have Cambridge Analytica that's measuring all of this and deciding how to deliver content. Facebook, this, what I'm, this thing is about what happened in 2017, how they set up their algorithms. So there is a margin of a year where Facebook was not exploiting those, those reactions, 
But Cambridge Analytica and, their, and the Trump campaign, at some point they started working for the Trump campaign, I forgot to say that, were using that information. So what did we learn from this? We learned that personal data is power, and this power can be over groups, if not all of society. They can affect, they can transform the discussion. And that changes everything, actually. That really changes the discussion around personal data. It's no longer about whether your, your neighbor is posting pictures of their holiday on Instagram or pictures of their kids or things like this. There is a different type of responsibility associated to that. And it's really a political responsibility because it's a question of how power gets distributed between different actors. That's politics. So then I started working on fighting back this, this situation. So I'll go quickly over this. I started telling Americans how they could apply their European data rights to get back copies of their data. So this is from the blog of, this was amplified by Cory Doctorow, trying to get more people to do this. And some Americans did go through this procedure and got copies of their data, which really changed the dynamic, the discourse around Cambridge Analytica, because now some citizens had hard evidence of things they were at least for sure trying to do. This became a movie, The Great Hack, a movie you can watch on Netflix, where this professor, that's his back, David Carroll, explains how he tries to get his data back. That's one of the strands of the story. But I also tried myself. So this American was trying, with respect to Cambridge Analytica, I was trying to focus on some bits of information that I thought was, was relevant with respect to Facebook. And that's, for instance, custom audiences. So I, I went to a court in the U.S. that was actually free to ask Facebook for a copy of my data, an arbitration court. And eventually they changed their systems. So they made it more transparent. You can now see through which audiences you are being targeted on Facebook, which leads to very interesting articles like this one at the top right from the New York Times. I downloaded the information that Facebook has on me. Yikes. And the first paragraph is saying, I didn't expect much from their transparency tools, but when I saw those audiences, I was really basically very surprised. And this was the headline in the, in the New York Times article. And then I also testified about bits of data they were not making available. I testified in the U.S. Parliament alongside the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower, Christopher Wiley. And this had downstream consequences. This was in March 2018. And on the right are questions from Senator Blumenthal to Mark Zuckerberg, um, as follow-up questions after his Congress testimony in June 2018. Uh, in the second paragraph, he mentions my testimony at the UK Parliament, saying to Zuckerberg, you said one thing, but this chap testifying at the UK Parliament said your legal team said the opposite. How do you reconcile the two? So this at the bottom is one of the articles that resulted from that, and another consequence is that they had to build another tool of transparency. Now, once all of those actions made that suddenly they started, I mean, people started paying attention to what I was doing and wanted to help me, either undercover, they didn't want to be as visible as I was, or they were ready to do that. So it really started to become a team sport. So I founded an association, Personal Data IO, had a wiki, and it's important that it was a wiki. For those who know, we used Wikibase, um, which is the software underneath Wikidata, to help us organize very complex data sets to make us more effective in moving forward. And I st so I learned a lot from that myself. So yes, personal data is power, but I'm the most legitimate actor to change how that data is translated to power. And then I also learned from building an association, from trying to get funding for it, this concept of theory of change. That's a very helpful topic if you want to change a systemic problem, a very, a very helpful frame to think about it. If you want to change a problem, there's four dimensions to this change. An individual has to understand the problem, has to understand how they can act with respect to that problem themselves, what are their inner capacities, how they can connect with others who also want to fix this problem, and how the group, the, the, the set of capacities represented by this, this group of people, how can they best act towards that problem externally. And I learned progressively that the best way to act in this context was to bring meaning as an effort of collective sense-making of the data landscape. If you do that, people will be grateful, will come back for more, and will want to help you more. And if you are trying to do that on top of it, with tools that are very aligned in the ethos, in the way you think about the problem, so a wiki based on open source software that we self-host, for instance, not Slack, 
then that creates what's called a recursive public, a group of people who are viscerally connected and concerned with the means of their own existence, which could be funding, legal, technical. There are many dimensions to this. But it becomes a much more cohesive group that it's easier to align to actually get the change. And I told you about this like abstract framing of the, the, the theory of change, the four dimensions of change. In this particular context, this, this capacity to act individually, I would call it autonomy, and the, the purpose of the meaning idea, the meaning as collective sense-making, is to have a better working of a group as a recursive public. So a group of people who are acutely aware of the tools they are using and why they are using those tools and have a better sense of how they could act collectively. And then I had another hypothesis, and this hypothesis was the best way for such a group to act is to build a data collective. Still an hypothesis, but it's one that fortunately I was able to, I'm, I'm able now to experiment with, and that's the project STLabs. So before I tell you about STLabs, I need to tell you a little bit about the setup of STLabs. So this is a project that was built jointly between my company, STI, and the Fonds Pioneer Migro Pioneer Fund. So this is a company running a project. This company, for its own, for, for the project's interest, this company has to be sustainable. We don't know that we will be sustainable within the time frame of the support of the Migro Pioneer Fund. So it's a company because we are free to try to get other business to help us make us more sustainable. We're, we're not completely locked with one funder. We have some autonomy ourselves to try to find ways of making ourselves sustainable. That's quite important, actually, when you're running such a project. Now, I said it was becoming a team sport. Now it's more. It's really a team that's working every day. We are uh, 11 people, seven full-time equivalent of people working on this. And this is a picture of a team in the time of pandemics is hard to get. This is the best we could, sorry. <laughs> so what is a data collective? A, data, a personal data collective is a group of people who get together to co-manage their personal data and extract value of this data that they would not be able to get otherwise. Not just monetary value, could be monetary value, but it could also be societal value, impact, whatever, whatever other forms of value you can, you can think of. And this, this comes from the observation that data is siloed, and there's a lot of miss, a lots of missed opportunity in this data. And this opportunity can't be captured through data collectives. That's what more or less appealed to the Migro Pioneer Fund, and it's the combination of different angles that we hope will make this sustainable. To help us make it more sustainable, we're also looking at five collectives in parallel, not just one. We could have picked one theme, but we didn't. We picked five in parallel, which will help focus on the commonalities, focus on exclusively that to ensure more sustainability of the whole project. Now, the first collective that I want to talk about is around this idea of meaning and autonomy. And I would frame that as data literacy. Right? So you better understand how your data is used, and you're able to act with respect to that. Simply said, it's kind of fundamental in what I'm trying to do. And so that's a collective of its own. So what do we do? We build dashboards that are, at the moment, what we do is we build dashboards on top of your data exports. So if you go to some of the major platforms, you can download your data. You can get a copy of your Facebook data. You can get a copy of your Twitter data. And, and so on and so on. And the more people are annoying with the platforms, like I was in the past, I know that the scope of data that you can get will expand. And I validated that step. So now I need to validate the second step is, you don't just get raw data, you get raw data, and there are people around you who are willing to make this useful to you, right? And so that's us now. So we have those dashboards that run in the browser, so there's no concern around privacy. We don't upload anything back at the moment. And they allow you to see a bit better how you're being targeted online. So we're running also workshops where people get together and they start pointing at each other's screen and they start to make hypotheses and they start to navigate this. It's not just passive dashboards, it's really dashboards to investigate this. So we're running those workshops 
a few, we haven't run many, but normally next week or in two weeks, we are going to go to the European Parliament to run such a workshop with European parliamentarians. So they're better able to understand how Facebook is targeting them on Twitter right now to do lobbying for the new laws that they are passing around Digital Services Act. Right? So Facebook is saying we enable small businesses, targeted advertising is really good, and so on. Well, they use another platform, Twitter, to try to lobby. So they target information to parliamentarians and their assistants with very specific talking points. It just happens that they do it on Twitter, and Twitter is a lot more transparent than Facebook itself. So we're able to give them more view of all the criteria that are used to target them. So that's one collective around literacy that I mentioned, but there are four other collectives. Dating privacy, that's around dating apps. Now, that's maybe a bit esoteric, but dating apps are extremely interesting. It's very sensitive data that people, maybe things like HIV status, that people give to multinationals without any idea of where this data is going. And those multinationals are also profiting from this data on the advertising market which is an absolute constant data leak. But not only that, also dating apps are putting together different groups of population. If you look in the heterosexual world or heterosexual side of things, and people are used to thinking about that encounter offline. What does it mean when a man meets a woman or vice versa, however you want to consider it? What are the dimensions that come into play? Right? There are used to thinking about that offline and what are the power relationships that are there. At least some proportion of the population is used to thinking about that. But then now this is being brought online. So can we use this culture that has been built offline around those topics to advance understanding online platforms? So I'm very lucky to work with um, a sociologist, Jessica Pidou, who did her thesis on those topics, um, and she's leading that collective. Another one is what we call the eyeballs. That's focused on the attention economy. I'll talk about it in a second. Another one is mobility, just mobility in general. And I know there are some people from POSMO here, so it's a very similar idea. And then another one is on gig work, the platform work, Uber drivers, delivery riders, all of those whose work is directly managed by algorithms and ultimately data is a tool of production in this whole landscape. Each collective has its own logic, very complex, that I'm still trying to find, to figure out and optimize. And it's really about finding the opportunity in the delicate balance between public, common, and individual interest. So it's, it's a very tricky thing. So I t told you I would talk more about the eyeballs. So with the eyeballs, we're building tools that really talk to the general public, understand how you're being targeted with advertisements, how your attention is being monetized. So, for instance, this is on French TV, starting to talk about the French elections that are coming. How are political parties targeting you with ads? So, targeting on social networks, and then we have another tool that's pretty cool, that it's a browser extension that tells you how much each advertisement was bid for. How much someone paid to advertise something to you. Not each, advertisements that follow the specific way of being sold. So, head bidding, it's called. But this is really interesting because then you can formulate all kinds of questions. You know, am I worth you more than you? Or are men worth more than women? Are Android users worth more than iOS users? Everyone wants to compare themselves to each other. So they naturally, from themselves, get into the dynamic of, well, we should put all that data together and analyze it. Of course, I'm like, oh, wait, wait, wait. We need to have proper governance. We need to do this well, et cetera, et cetera. But people really buy into this idea. Now, I'm... I will finish with two big learnings. One is open versus privacy, because this is a community that's often about open topics. Now, in my perspective, I belong to both communities, open community, the privacy conscious community, but historically there has been tension between the two. I would advise, uh, or the way I think about it, and I think it's productive, is to relentlessly think about what should be open in there. Not everything should be, but some parts of it should be. And if you are very, very precise about what should be open, that can conversely increase privacy. So the idea is to really, you could map personal data ecosystems to make sense together of what, what is going on 
and to really assess what value should be shared through open dynamics. And at the interface between the two, there are new ways of aggregating personal data for collective interest, of making data that is useful for the group. It's very subtle. It requires a lot of humility and technical skills to understand exactly where the risks are, the risks of re-identification in particular, and what are the appropriate monetization strategies on top of this data. And then the other learning is that you don't want only a map of personal data ecosystems to be, to be available and openly, openly available. You want everyone to contribute back to it and to know why they want to contribute back to it. Right? So now we have a, a layer of licensing on top. The obvious mental example is OpenStreetMap. How does OpenStreetMap encourage people to contribute back? Because they have a, a copyleft database license called the ODBL. But for this problem, our personal data, it's a bit different. It's not quite the same, not quite the same incentives that can work. Because with OpenStreetMap, you have to contribute back if you start using their data to produce a map. And this map is yours. You can control it however you want. Here it's slightly different. If you build infrastructure, it doesn't mean you can use personal data however you want. You want a structure of incentives that's a bit different. I don't have the answer, but I know that that's a core problem. So just to finish, data collectives enable us to regain meaning, to re-understand what is going on with our personal data in a sustainable way, which gives us back autonomy. And they should exist on top of open and properly licensed infrastructure. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions either in person now or by email. Thank you, Paul. I'm uh, quickly opening up our Slido question channel right here. Um, I really liked the um, the way that you built it up over through your personal story. That made it very relatable. Thank you very much. It was very insightful. Um, so I see we have uh, well, at least one top question here. Um, Anonymous is asking, what would be ways to participate in data collectives without having technical skills? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a really good question. So there's two angles, two angles. So one is we could help you and we want to help you gain higher technical skills. So understand what your data is about, what could be done with it, and so on. So for instance, it's, it's really a great feeling. It's, I'm still getting shivers now. To, to help an Uber driver take his data, get his data back from Uber, right? So after very, very long interactions with, with, uh, with legal at Uber, they get a copy of their data. And then you tell them, now you drop it into this tool, Kepler GL. Kepler GL. You drop it there, and then suddenly they see a map of their activity. Right? Just the tool works like that. Their, their face just <laughs> enlightens. No, it's true. I mean, it has happened four or five times. Like, they just, wow. Wow. And they start immediately browsing and looking, and they get really invested in this. And then they, for, for days afterwards, they send me like the screenshots of the, through WhatsApp, they send me screenshots of their screen, like what they figured out. It's really, really fascinating. So they're really building in capacity. The, the really interesting element is that Kepler G, GL is built by Uber. It's an open source library running in the browser that Uber built so that the managers have a good view of what the drivers are doing. Mm -hmm. right? So you, it's just you get it back and then you put it back in the same tool. But in, instantly, they get the view of the manager. Mm -hmm. So that's the first angle. It's a long answer. Sorry. So okay. building capacity. And the second one is I have my own point of view on those problems, my own angle, my own way of solving things, which is very technical. I hired mostly technical people because... The technical problems are transversal to the five collectives. Mm -hmm. But for each of the themes, and even we need input. We need a lot of expertise that goes beyond technical on marketing, on communications, on, on uh, how to reach out, how to form commercial partnerships, because we want those collectives to be sustainable. We need help everywhere. So I'm sure Anonymous has also skills that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And the, I wonder, though, to collectives usually, I mean, it's, to me, it sounds as a mental image of a big group of people. 
So like a broad base of members who are who are basically donating their data to this data collective. So you, is that is that true? You're angling for for a broad base, like just anybody being part of the collective, or will there be like, you know, a certain membership fee or something that we? No, so so yes, that's that. Okay, I acknowledge <laughs> the question. A lot of people are thinking in terms of scale, number of people. Yeah, that's part of the response, but actually. We're overwhelmed by the digital in two ways. The fact that we're small in a big, big problem, one of a billion users of X or Y company, so yes, we're small in that sense, but we're also overwhelmed by the complexity of the landscape. So from your perspective, addressing many different companies can also be very empowering. Right? And so I reject the idea that only big collectives can be useful. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely not true. A single Uber, drivers, Uber driver who gets his data back and who trusts us, we are able to build a trust relationship with them. We're able to really dig deep into the data mm -hmm. to build, I mean, you can't do it blind. You have to see some data in order to be able to build the infrastructure that would run in the browser, right, to enable more people to analyze their data. So just one person can make a huge difference, both in terms of technology we can build, but also in literacy we can build, mm -hmm. because we can just from one driver, build videos of like, this is what their data is about, this is what could be deduced. This, is, this has already an enormous impact. Mm -hmm. What are you planning to do with the data and with the aggregated data and the analysis that you're doing with it? Are there are any concepts of maybe building a business around it, maybe selling analysis? I'm, <laughs> I'm not the one making that decision. You're not. It's the collectives. Yeah. So the goal is to, to make it um, easier to build a sustainable business around collecting this data, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So to, to enable the collectives to become sustainable by very pointedly collecting data that is of very high value that they can then partly monetize for their own common interest. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily public, the collective, the common to the collective. And so what I, the business model for STL AI or STL Labs long term is lower the cost for increased value, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's in this offering services to those collectives. Um, so there are no more questions on online. Are there any questions from the live audience? Yeah. Yes, we have one back there. You're probably going to have to um, <laughs> yell. <laughs> are you going to get a microphone? One moment, please. <laughs> <laughs> but I think for the for the people if, online, if I, if I can <laughs> add one into my sensor, the hard bit is not the technology or the business model. The hard bit is building trust and yeah. sustaining the trust. Yeah. Any more? Yeah. Um, maybe it's a bit too personal, but what interests me is you having testified in front of the Congress. What's your take on personal risk to doing so compared to political outcome? Sure. Was it worth Was it worth it? <laughs> So I testified in front of the UK Parliament, not the US Congress, but yes. But um, there is no risk. If you, I, I'm not a whistleblower. I'm not taking legal risk there. I'm just telling what the company has told me. Right. So maybe the risk was before in being the only one who stood up or one of the very, very few who stood up to exercise their rights. But that's also why I wanted to be a team sport. Because the more people do it, the more journalists do it, the more impact it has, and the less risk I personally take. That answer. Thanks. So um, maybe we have room for one more question um, right here. Uh, yes, because in uh, five minutes, people have to go <laughs> to their next sessions. But I think one more question and a short answer from Paul, Sorry, and then yes. we can... Uh... Thank you, Paul. Thank you. My question is, today we know that China is using the data of Chinese to do a rating and to, to tell them if they can take these services or, or whatever. On the other side, we see that in Europe, for example, all the, the bici electrical bicycles, etc., they are using the data, the geolocalization data, to track if we are going faster from one point to another, if it's faster than the legal uh, speed. Mm -hmm. And this data is then sold, uh, sold to the insurance companies to, to say, okay, this person he, uh, uh, drives faster than the usual, he is at risk. Or this person is using the smartphone very late in the night, so he sleeps very few hours, so he's 
more uh, in risk for the health. What do you think about this uh, selling of data to the com private companies? So I don't know that um, those particular sales happen, but for sure there are sales like this that happen. I think the right angle is to approach that, is to tell um, authorities, you know, you deployed an app called Swiss COVID, you sold to the general population that this app was safe, but it's broadcasting in the clear Bluetooth identifiers that can be caught by some portion of the population. So let's try it. How many people here have TikTok installed? <laughs> All right. Two. <laughs> oh, wow. So just four of them are able to report for all of Swiss COVID users in this room to have been in close proximity. That means that in two weeks, if one of us is infected, the Swiss, uh, the TikTok could potentially, I'm not saying they're doing it, but certainly have the permissions and technical capacity to deduce a higher risk for this particular crowd. And this is completely undermining, this is, th those are facts, and this, this is completely undermining all of the discourse around the security of Swiss COVID. But it's a fact. So we have to address that. And there is just no other way than to face that fact. Okay. And then the, the, the commercial surveillance is the step. So um, I think there probably would still be quite a, a lot more questions. Um, and I hope that you're open. And I think you are to an ongoing dialogue. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last thing that we ever heard of you. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, if there are more questions, I guess contact Paul um, here or I think you're online on Twitter as well. Yes, yes you'll find him everywhere. Um, thank you very much, Paul, thank you. for coming, thank you for, for taking invitation. your time. I have a little <laughs> gift here. Thank you. Well done. Thank you.